The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com, where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? And this week on Where Did The Road Go, we have Laird Scranton, who has written a number of books on the Dogon, uh, The Cosmological Origins of Myth and Symbol, which is his latest, as well as Sacred Symbols of the Dogon and the Science of the Dogon. And he's also written, uh, his latest book is actually on Velikovsky. And uh, Laird, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Thanks. All right. And uh, that, that's all the books you've done so far, right? These four. That's right. These four so far. There's also an earlier self-published book called Hidden Meanings that got republished as The Science of the Dogen. Okay. All right. And when, when did you, uh, get, how did you get involved in, in this subject matter? Actually, I, I can thank my wife for that. She gave me a book called Unexplained by Jerome Clark one time. And one of the, the chapters in this book was about the Dogen and about um, how they had some astronomic knowledge they shouldn't really have without access to... Uh, uh, major telescopes. Mm. Okay. And you just started doing research on your own? Yeah, I thought, well, if they, they know things about astronomy, they shouldn't. That's got to be interesting no matter where it leads. And I uh, started digging into it and discovered all sorts of, that was just the tip of the iceberg of the interesting things about this tribe. Hmm. Okay. And uh, did you plan on writing books about them? No, actually, I, n I never did. Uh, I sort of, it sort of happened by accident. I was keeping notes for myself about what I was learning and trying to keep the notes organized. And uh, after a while, I realized that I haven't had enough material to write an article if I wanted to, and eventually enough material to write a book. And I thought, well, why not? It's so inexpensive to self-publish. Mm. Um, put it in book form. And, and you, so you self-publish it. How did it end up on Inner Traditions? Well, then uh, I was trying to promote the book through e targeted emails to people who might be interested, and one of those emails reached uh, Egyptologist John Anthony West, um, who had an interest in the book and ended up uh, taking it down to New York to a publishing fair and personally shopping publishers until he found Inner Traditions. That's awesome. Um, so you've written three books on the Dogon so far, and uh, you want to give people a little history of who the Dogon are and why they're so important? Sure. The, the Dogon are, are interesting. They're a modern-day tribe from Africa, from Mali, which is in, the, in northwest Africa, in sort of the, the bulge there of Africa. And they're, they represent a kind of crossroads of ancient traditions. They have rituals like ancient Judaism and uh, civic traditions like ancient Egypt. And they have um, a cosmology that looks a lot like ancient Buddhism. And the thing about them is that they're a, a living tribe with living priests who understand their own references, and uh, they can explain what the symbols and the myths um, are supposed to mean. And they, they were first in, uh, investigated back when? There were two French anthropologists uh, back, started in the 1930s and spent three decades with the tribe uh, documenting their religion and their language. And uh, they were named Marcel Griol and Germain Dieterlin. And uh, they put together um, a number of articles and a couple of books about the Dogen, including a, uh, an anthropological study called The Pale Fox. And this is the, the major source of information about the tribe. Hmm. Okay, and uh, that's where the information about their, their astronomical knowledge comes from, isn't it? That's right. Uh, that pretty, much every, pretty much everything that is known about the Dogen uh, came out of those uh, you know, three decades of study. Okay, and uh, what, what's so unusual about their, their astronomical knowledge? Well, it, you start with um, the stars of Sirius, which uh, Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. It's the, the star you see if you look, if you follow where the belt stars of Orion point downward to, you see this really bright star, and that's Sirius. But in truth, it's not really one star. It's um, at least two stars. There's a, a sun-like star that's very bright, and there's a small dwarf star that you can't see because of the glare of the, the brighter star. And the Dogen knew that the second star existed, and they knew the correct orbital period for the two stars, and uh, some other information about that star system that scientists, you know, our scientists didn't know until um, 
uh, probably in the 1950s or 1960s. Okay, and uh, now do the Dogon say there's three stars? Yeah, the the Dogon say there are three, and the astronomers have not actually uh, completely verified the third star. There have been sightings of the third star and claims to have seen it, but I don't think there's been final verification that the third star exists there. Okay, and uh, what is the importance of Sirius to the Dogon tribe? Well, the Dogon, um, they're... Their most important uh, ritual celebration happens every 60 years. Actually, they say it happens every 60 years. It's really every 50 years. And it's uh, to celebrate the stars of, of Sirius. Uh, but when you get into their cosmology, the, the real importance of, of Sirius is that they equate it to a structure of matter. Uh, they say that what happens up in the microcosm above us um, relates to what happens in the, I mean, the macrocosm above us, it relates to the, what happens in the microcosm below us. And that if we want to see examples of this, Sirius plays a role in this um, macrocosmic example of how matter is formed. Okay. Don't, don't they also claim their ancestors came from Sirius or related to Sirius in some way? It, it depends on who you, who you talk to. I mean, they, they associate some ancient teachers with Sirius and uh, Robert Temple's book, The Serious Mystery, um, heavily uh, leaned towards claims that uh, it, they represented an alien contact with, um, with humans back in ancient times. Oh. Uh, but, but the Dogen uh, don't overtly say that their teachers came from Sirius. Okay. All right. Well, that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting point because you always hear that they said explicitly that they came from Sirius, so they didn't. Uh, no, although the Dogen do talk about a non-human source of information, uh, as the Buddhists do, they talk about spiritual beings. That again, there is just an association with Sirius, but it's not uh, it's not as overt as saying somebody came from Sirius to he to the Earth to visit us. Okay, well let let, let me throw this idea at you then. Um, could it be that uh, I know you're familiar with Wal Walter Cruttenton's work? Yes, absolutely. And could it be that uh, if he's right and we, we move through different phases of consciousness and are in a binary system with Sirius, that when Sirius is closer, we have access maybe to these teachers who are at a higher level of consciousness or something we can't perceive at a lower level of consciousness? That could be. I mean, the Dogen priests say that the, these stars of Sirius, especially this little dwarf star, which is very dense, um, regulate uh, events that happen in our region of the, of the universe. Hmm. And so there is a suggestion there that there they, we could be involved in another rotation that hasn't been recognized um, that involves our sun and Sirius. Okay, all right. Um, now, there's there's argument over whether or not the Dogon's information it was taken from us, from visitors to their tribe, or if it was actually genuine ancient knowledge. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Sure. Well, the the most um, the most difficult to argue point uh, that says that it was ancient knowledge is that all of the uh, Dogen system of cosmology, their, their whole creation tradition, is given using words that are ancient Egyptian words. And so Carl Sagan was ar made the argument that a modern visitor must have come to the Dogen and taught them some scientific knowledge. But the difficulty is it would be hard to imagine which modern visitor would have get taught that to them using ancient Egyptian words. Mm. Also, the fact that all the same concepts that even exist in the ancient Egyptian language um, demonstrates that it has, it has to have been ancient knowledge. Okay. All right. And some of it we didn't really know at the time either, did we? No, we didn't. At the time Carl Sagan wrote, uh, we didn't know that. Uh, I was the first person to really explore whether there could be connections between the words. Okay. Um, and it's a very complicated system of cosmology they have using, uh, you know, very well-defined terms, and each of these terms um, you can link back to the Egyptian hieroglyphic language. One of the features of the words is that every word has at least two meanings, and the two meanings are, are distanced from each other in a way so that knowing one doesn't enable you to guess the second meaning. Hmm. Well, that's and so interesting. When, you, when you find these um, sets of meanings that are logically disconnected, um, reproduced in the Egyptian hieroglyphic language under the same pronunciation, you really have a lock on a correlation. Okay, and, and there, there's also connections with uh, ancient Hebrew and Indian, and you're saying Chinese cultures now too, right? 
Yes, there's um, a lot of the Egyptian words. Even even uh, Sir Wallace Budge, who wrote the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary, uh, he frequently uses Hebrew words and letters to explain the pronunciation and meanings of Egyptian words. A lot of the Dogon words are also Egyptian words and are also Hebrew words, and you can find equivalencies across there. But um, these concepts, these sets of concepts, where you have multiple meanings associated with the concept, cross the boundaries of of cultures and of languages. So in uh, Buddhism and in India, where you have um, concepts expressed in languages that are based on Sanskrit, um, you can still make a correlation back to the Dogon because the terms are connected to these same sets of meanings. Okay. Now, now, can you go a little bit into the Dogon creation story? Sure. I mean, it really is science. Uh, the, they talk about how their tribal god created matter. And I could see when I was researching them that they had the definition of an atom correct and the definition of protons and neutrons and electrons correct, and that they even drew a picture to diagram it that looked uh, like the image of an electron orbit that you get using an electron microscope. And so I thought, if they have those top structures right, what are the chances that the descending levels of matter that they describe could also be right? And so I started educating myself about that, reading Brian Greene and Stephen Hawking, and discovered that you could lay the Dogen description side by side with descriptions from Hawking or from Brian Greene, and right right next to side by side the diagrams that both give, and you could it, it's a an obvious comparison. It's it you don't even have to um, make an argument. They're they are intuitively the same. Okay, and they, and they start also with a, uh, and and they they use like um, deity names and such to. To relate these things, but they're still in a scientific context. Is that is that how a good way of explaining it? Uh, that's a good way of explaining it. The the Dogen system seems to represent a very early version of the Egyptian, and in the Dogen system, it doesn't it hasn't evolved to the level of deities and yet it's if it, it's still being couched in terms of scientific concepts. But by the time you get and, and also in terms of um, symbolism. But by the time you get to Egypt, then each of these stages of matter has become personified with a, a, a deity in Egypt whose traditional role tells you what what stage of matter they're talking about. Mm. Okay. Can you, can you, can you, what are the stages of matter? In, the, uh, it's a, in, in one of my books I have, I think, uh, a five-page layout mm -hmm. of the structure of matter from bottom, from, from waves to atom that are expressed strictly in terms of Egyptian uh, glyphs and deities and words. And so there are many, many multiple stages here, but basically it goes from waves to um, an act of perception um, interferes with a matter in its wave-like form and causes it to be reorganized um, to form what science calls a calabi yao space, and the Dogen call it the egg of the world. And this uh, vibrations uh, cause what appear to us to look like particles of matter, and these particles of matter eventually create mass, and mass eventually creates gravity, and you eventually end up with small particles of matter that combine together to form atoms and so forth. And so basically what we're talking is that they're, they're describing quantum physics. They're, yeah, they're, to, they're describing a system that really is, is torsion theory. Torsion theory is a, a version of string theory that um, it differs from string theory in that it postulates that at every point in space-time, there's this tiny little vortex that is responsible for the the force of gravity. Wow. Okay. That that's a fairly new theory. Yeah. These are these are fairly new theories. String theory wasn't really didn't even reach the public consciousness till about 1980, and the French anthropologists had do documented this with the Dogen by 1956. So there's no chance that there was borrowing from string theory. Right. What what uh, now? Has anyone looked at the Egyptian um, mythology in this way prior to you yes, doing this? I mean, I have. I've, I've taken each aspect of this Dogen creation tradition, the words, the symbols, the myths, and so forth, and, and tracked each one to an Egyptian counterpart. That's what really I do in the first, um, the first two books I wrote, Science of the Dogen and the Sacred Symbols of the Dogen. Right, but before that, has anyone ever looked at the Egyptian myths as if they were a scientific creation story? Um, there were suggestions of it, uh, but nobody was really able to demonstrate that it was true. But when you go back into India, there are, there are a lot of resemblances between science and myth. 
and there have been numerous people over the years who have said, hey, this looks like science to me. Hmm. Okay. So I'm not the first person to do that, but I think I am the first one to be able to show in a coherent way that the Egyptian system looks like science. Okay, all right. Um, how, so what this basically says is that all these cultures have a, a connection further back in history that they've split off from. That's right. If you go back far enough in any one of the traditions, what you bump into is the idea that somebody smarter than we were um, made a deliberate attempt to raise our, our um, educational status up, our, our civilized status up from uh, being hunter-gatherers to being farmers. And that they, had, they deliberately presented what looks like a, a civilizing plan that is associated with all these symbols and all these myths that were supposed to help us acquire the skills we needed to be able to do that. So it's kind of like a hidden scientific map as well underneath it all. Yes, I mean, it'd be, I compare it to uh, if, you, if you have a two-year-old who wants to know where babies come from, you know, uh, most parents realize that, that they need to tell the child a story that is based on something real, even, though, even if it doesn't include all of the intimate details. You know, they tell them that a part of the mother comes together, you know, father comes together with a part of the mother and creates a baby. Well, that, that's sort of the way that these, these myths and these traditions were, were created wa was on, on different levels where in the outer level you get the, the two-year-old's version of the story and the deeper into it you get, the, more, the closer you get to the actual science. Okay. Now, they, how did they preserve this tradition? Originally, it was all mnemonic. Uh, it was all by oral tradition. There was no, no system of writing. And the, the Dogen tradition uh, does, does not have a native system of writing. But it has a lot of the same symbols connected to a lot of the same meanings as were used in the Egyptian hieroglyphic language. And so um, it's traditionally thought that cosmology preceded writing in these in ancient cultures. It looks to me as if these symbols that were already well defined in the cosmology ended up being adopted as as written characters in the earliest languages. Hmm. Okay, and uh, they, they have a, a a process of of building that also is mnemonic for them. Correct. Well, they have an, a number of uh, of techniques and approaches they use to, uh, towards symbolism. The at the most basic, it starts with what are called what the Buddhists call adequate symbols. An adequate symbol is something. It's defined as a symbol that that cannot lose its meaning, even if the initiates to the tradition forget what it means. And the way that works is because the image is something that you can actually see in nature that's connected to a specific thing, like the shape of an electron orbit. Um, it's, it's perfectly natural if you can see the shape of an electron orbit to associate that with the concept of an electron. Mm -hmm. And so even if you know, thousands, for thousands of years we all forgot what that shape meant, eventually we'd be able to recover that once we had the technology to see it again. I see. Okay. And what, what, what do you think this culture is that tried to preserve all this information? Do you have any, uh, any thoughts on that? About who the teachers were? Yeah. Okay, well, it, it's hard to say. I can say for certain that it looks like they had our best interests at heart because they didn't seem to pull any punches at all. They gave us the, the truthful explanations of what all these uh, processes of creation are, and they seem to have uh, bent over backwards to give it to us in the best way that they could. The Dogen asked their teachers if, if they were God, and the teachers answered, no, we're not God, but you can think of us, if you want to, as agents of God. Hmm. So do you think there's a connection there to, like, the Anunnaki or uh, other types of, of civilizers elsewhere in the world? Yes, a absolutely. The, this tradition dates from around 3000 B.C., and um, in any of these ancient cultures, um, there, one of my books, the, the third book, Cosmological Origins of Myth and Symbol, one, one of the purposes of the book is to try to lay out what I consider to be the signature signs of this tradition. And by that, I mean that if you see one of these in an ancient culture, it's a pretty good indicator that they had the same um, educational system. Hmm. Okay, can you give us an example of that? Uh, yeah, the easiest example, the most familiar example would be uh, the four elements, water, wind, earth, and fire. You see that in the culture, and it's pretty certain that they had the same uh, tradition. Hmm. And you don't think that could be a coincidence? No, not really. The reason it can't, um, 
another example I tend to use is uh, the concept of pyramid building. Mm -hmm. um, critics will say, well, look, any two cultures that use stone as their primary building material are going to eventually think to stack these stones up and make a pyramid out of them. So uh, you can't say that those are connected at all. That's a natural thing that somebody would do. And my answer to that is to say that's true, but there's a very complicated symbolism that attaches to these forms. It's the same in South America as it is in Africa as it is in Asia. Not, not only that, but they're all, they all tend to have astronomical alignments. And why would all these cultures decide to do that? That's right, and it's not just the astronomical alignments, but they use the astronomical alignments to do things like control their agricultural cycle. And these are these are, are commonalities that go way beyond the possibility of coincidence. So it's the symbolism that demonstrates that it can't just be um, coincidence or can't be parallel development. All right, so now the Dogons have a different uh, different view of like deities and gods and stuff, don't they? Yeah, well, for the Dogen, the, the only thing they really define as a deity or as a god is the piece of the creation process that's at the very beginning that they can't explain. Like, you know that when a, when, uh, a sperm comes together with an egg, that that causes a process of life to start. Well, nobody tries to explain what makes that happen. And at, at, when you reach that point of the thing that you don't try to explain, that's the point where they assign the deity. Hmm, okay. Now, Ama is the, the their... Uh, their creator their god. Their creator god, okay. And, and he, he's a counterpart to Amen in, in Egypt. Okay, now, but they don't worship him necessarily, do they? No, they don't. As a matter of fact, they use the word celebrate, where later traditions use the word worship. Um, it's very interesting to see the way things change. Um, where the later religions uh, have an opposition between good and evil, the Dogen have an opposition between truth and error. Hmm. And so the Dogen version of this stuff is a very non judgmental, very um, clear headed um, incarnation of what la became the later religions. Interesting. Um, now, they also said that Amma is, is, is it infinitely small or just very, very small? Yes, uh, it, that's a secret. That's something that's not nor typically talking about, talked about in open among the, the Dogen. Only the initiates talk about that or know that. But in fact, that Amma is very, very, very small. Uh, it's because Amma resides at really at the, at the point where uh, perception causes a wave to turn into a particle. Hmm. Okay, all right. So it, it, it's almost like the point where consciousness interacts with matter. That's right. It's a, that, absolutely. And same thing, um, each, there's one set of symbols here, one uh, thread of symbols that simultaneously represent um, the creation of matter and the processes of biological reproduction and the processes of the creation of the universe. These are the three creational themes that some very intelligent person put a system together that are all defined in parallel terms. Oh, huh, okay. Um, now, is he considered a dual god, or is he a singular like point that becomes duality? He's dual, and with a lot of the cosmological terms, you can see it in the term itself. Ama is really a compound of two words. Am uh, means knowledge, um, and the comparison I make is to the word to know in the bi biblical sense refers to conception of you know, biological con conception. In the Bible, it says, you know, he knew her, and they're talking about mm -hmm. he conceived a baby. Ma is an Egyptian term that refers to perception, which is the initiating stage of matter. So Ama combines the initiating stage of biological reproduction with the initiating stage of matter into one term. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, let, let's, uh, also, there, there, there are the pneumo fish in their culture. And there, there, there's this symbolism also you get in Sumeria and other cultures. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the pneumo fish is one of the drawings that the Dogen priests make to explain how things work. And the Dogen, the Dogen priests say that these drawings are so um, essential to the concepts that they're describing that, that they feel that they can't even discuss the concepts without drawing them in the sand with a stick at the same time. They need the drawing in order to explain the thing. So the pneumo fish drawing is 
um, a diagram that it, that from my point of view um, demonstrates what happens when a wave is perceived. Now in string theory, you know, if you read Brian Greene or Stephen Hawking or any of the people who are writing about string theory, nobody ever talks about how is it that an act of perception causes matter to change from wave-like behavior to particle behavior. But the Dogen do. The Dogen uh, talk about in, in great detail about that process. And how so, did, go, on. Oh, go ahead. Oh, how, how do they say that that works? Um, okay, if you if you know um, about quantum theory and about Heisenberg, Heisenberg says that when you get down to small enough particles, you, um, we don't have tools small enough to be able to observe them without disturbing them. So. Inherently, if you look at something that's very, very, very small, the very act of observing it changes it. Hmm. Well, when you get down to massless waves, uh, which are at the bottom of the whole structure, um, any act of perception has got to disturb it. And if, if, if it's a massless wave to begin with, which is the same thing as having no acceleration, the only, thing, the only way you can disturb it is by accelerating it and giving it mass. And so they say that that an act of perception causes this underlying wave to draw up like a, a tent. Imagine a piece of tent cloth that you grab in the middle and you pull up in the middle to create a tent-like shape. Hmm. And that that drawing up of the tent causes the waves above it to encircle and starts a process of, of repetitive encircling that happens seven times to create these Calabi-Yau spaces. Uh, the calabi yau space in string theory is considered to be um, a little point in space and time that represents wrapped up seven wrapped up dimensions. Right. Okay. Um, and the so way the delta des describe it, these these dimensions don't have enough mass to support their own weight, and so they collapse. Okay. Um, now, I'm trying to think how I want to phrase this question. Um, you're the first person to, who, who has interpreted this stuff this way, correct? Right. And one of the things I had to worry about, one of the biggest things I had to worry about coming into this was how do you defend against your own wishful interpretation of something? Mm -hmm. And so one of the rules I made for myself was that every interpretation has to start with either an explicit statement on the part of the culture I'm studying or it's got to be something that's understood the same way by more than one culture. Well, now as I move along and I've studied India and Tibet and Egypt and Africa and now into China, I have enough different cross-referencing sources that I can compare one to the other about what they say about a given subject matter. And when I can show that they're all in agreement, then I know that I'm on fairly firm ground in terms of the interpretation that I'm moving forward with. Hmm. Okay. And, and they also believe in sort of a creation via word, right? The word is, a, is one of the metaphors they use um, to explain what happens. I, we talked about water, wind, earth, and fire. Mm -hmm. That's an example of a four-stage metaphor that is used to help us understand a complex set of symbols. Um, they, they provide a number of these four-stage metaphors. And so, uh, for example, one of them is given in terms of, of the animal kingdom. They talk about at the lowest level are insects and then fish and then four-legged animals and then birds. Well, wh in, if you look at those metaphors, they help you to understand things like Egyptian gods who have animal heads. If you see that Kepper, who, the dung beetle Kepper, who has the head of, a, of an insect, you know automatically by the fact that it is an insect that his symbolism is going to fall in the earliest stage of matter. He represents the concept of non-existence coming into existence. Or if you look at Thoth, who has the head of a bird, you know automatically by this metaphor that his symbolism is going to fall at the high end of matter. Okay, well, do you think that the, the Egyptian uh, mythology was just more, uh, like it evolved more away from the origin than the Dogons did? Yes, it, the, whoever put the system together realized that, that things evolve over time. You know, they know, uh, they, they know about the game Telephone. <laughs> if you've ever played it. Um, and so what they did was that one of the traditions that happened in ancient times was periodically they would send a group, uh, a priestly group out into the wilderness 
with the task of deliberately locating themselves someplace very inhospitable and very inaccessible, sort of as a way of making a backup of the tradition. And that's what I think the Dogen are. The hmm. Dogen are located an eight-hour drive from anything you'd, you'd ever want to visit. Hmm. They're in the middle of the desert along uh, some a lengthy series of cliffs, and they've lived uh, fairly much in isolation where their tradition can, where they can maintain their own tradition without interference from other people. Wow. And there are priestly tribes like this around the world and other groups that observe the same tradition, like the Hopi Indians um, had the tradition of sending out priestly groups to relocate themselves the same way. Hmm. Do you see any connections between cultures in, in uh, North or South America and the Dogon yet? Yep, a absolutely. As a matter of fact, the, the book I just am finishing up on China makes a direct connection between China and Mongolia and China and North America. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and what's that one going to be called? Uh, that's a good question. My working title <laughs> is China and the Plan of Ancient Cosmology. But uh, the uh, when you work with a publisher, one of the few tools the publisher has to to sort of posture a book in the marketplace is its title. Right. And so they tend to be very, very picky about what they, they want to name a book. And very rarely do they go with the working title that the author <laughs> came up. All right. Well, uh, the last thing on the Dogon I guess I want to ask you about is uh, the, the controversy involving Walter Van Beek. Okay. Walter Van Beek. Okay. I, we talked about the French anthropologist who studied the Dogon for 30 years um, until Marcel Griot died suddenly in 1956. Uh in 1975, Robert Temple wrote his book, The Serious Mystery, and suddenly the Dogen became very, very controversial because Temple was trying to use them as evidence of an alien contact. Mm -hmm. Now, suddenly it became important to send another team into the Dogen country to restudy them. Um, it's not uncommon in the world of anthropology for an anthropologist to restudy some, you know, some part of the work of a previous anthropologist. But in this case, they sent Walter Van Beek, who was a Belgian in, and Walter Van Beek's specialty was ecology. They sent him in to do a restudy, not just of a piece of Griol's work, but really to restudy the entire life's work of Griol, which is about religion, not ecology. And Griol had described a, a tradition with the Dogen that was, that we call the esoteric tradition. It's a, it, it's a complicated secret tradition. And the way it works is uh, that any tribes person, any Dogen tribes person, has the right to learn the innermost secrets of the tradition if they just continue to ask the next leading question that leads them the next step towards understanding it. It's the job of the initiate to to ask the question to learn more. And so, if I, as an initiate, ask an appropriate question, a Dogen priest is is obligated to give me a truthful answer. But if I were to come in from the outside and ask a question that was inappropriate to my initiated status, they're required to remain silent or to tell a lie if they have to, to protect the secrets. And so Van Beek and his team came in from outside, even though they knew that Griol had, had documented that the tradition works this way, Van Beek's, Beek's team came in starting asking leading questions about Griol's work, and everybody in the Dogen, Dogen tribe said, I don't know about that. Don't ask me. I never heard of that. <laughs> I compare what he did to um, a visitor who goes to a college campus on parents' weekend and comes away having found no evidence of drug or alcohol use. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Van Beek came away saying, you know, I, we can't recreate Griol, Griol's findings, and so clearly his study is flawed, that we think the Dogen priests invented this system just to satisfy Griol. It doesn't really exist. It's not real. Hmm. But so, I, w I was fortunate in that, in, at, okay, he made that determination around 1985. Now, around 2005, my daughter Hannah went to India and came back telling me about a ritual shrine called a stupa that she'd seen all around India, India that she thought resembled a shrine that the Dogen make. And so she and I sat down and I made some predictions about the symbolism of a stupa, sight unseen, and we used the internet to, to demonstrate that each of those predictions was right. And then I did some study about the symbolism of a stupa and discovered that it relates to a cosmology that's point for point the same as what Griol documented in terms of this Dogen Shrine. Hmm. The two systems match. 
So I then wrote an article for Anthropology News through the University of Chicago that basically said, look, uh, Van B can't possibly be right about this because if Griot's system matches the Buddhist system, then both have to be legitimate. Right, right. Huh. All right. Well, uh, we're going to take a quick 45-second break, and we're going to come back and talk to you about Velikovsky. Okay, uh, sounds good. Thanks. Do you want to tell people where they can get your book? Books? Books? Well, uh, they're available at all the usual outlets. Um, if, if you want, you can start with my publisher's website, www.innertraditions.com. Or you can find them uh, pretty much on any. Uh, if you you can Google my name on uh, Google or any one of the search engines and find references to the books, there are probably thirty thousand outlets out there where you can get the books. You can go to Amazon. You can go to Buy. dot com. You can go to uh, Barnes and Noble. dot com. And and you you do and don't have a website. Uh, there is a website under my name, but it's not really my official website. Uh, the guy who put it together has seems to have done a good job, and um, there is valid information about me there and, uh, and the ability to contact me from it. And that's LairdScranton.com. That's right. Okay, we'll be back in 45 seconds with Laird Scranton. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. And tonight we have Laird Scranton, author of many books on the Dogon, and his latest is The Velikovsky Heresies. So, uh, Laird, how did you get interested in Velikovsky? Well, Emmanuel Velikovsky was a very interesting character, and I first learned about him when I was in high school in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Portland was uh, sort of a, a hotbed of support for this crackpot's crackpot. Um, <laughs> Velikovsky was... Um, a psychiatrist and a historian who was a longtime colleague of Albert Einstein's. And he was researching a book in New York at Columbia University in the 1940s and came across some, some ancient Egyptian texts that seemed to be describing the ten plagues of Egypt as if they were a real historical event. And so Velikovsky became interested in that and began following leads from Egypt and from other cultures uh, relating to this kind of a global uh, cataclysm and discovered that um, all the cultures were saying the same thing. They were saying that um, the destruction was caused by a comet and the name that they gave to the comet initially they eventually assigned to the planet Venus in culture after culture. They did it in, in the Middle East and they did it in South America and they did it in Asia. They did it all over the world and so Velikovsky evolved the theory that Venus had to be a recent addition to our solar system not billions of years old. And this was a very very controversial theory back in 1950. He wrote a book called Worlds in Collision that turned the scientific community on its head and sold um, thousands and thousands of books based on the idea that Venus was a new planet. Okay. Okay so um, uh, Velikovsky died in 1979, mostly persona non grata. He, uh, uh, even though many there are many aspects of his uh, theory that um, over time were shown to be reasonable, uh, the mainstream scientists never bought into his theory and did everything they could to try to discredit him. And by the time he died, um, he really um, was considered to be an, an outsider in science. Um, even to this day, if there are new discoveries that are made in astronomy that look like they might support Velikovsky, his name's not mentioned. Uh, <laughs> the new announcement is usually accompanied by um, a second theory that is whose purpose or whose net effect is to um, to distance that finding from Velikovsky. And why do you think that is? I think it is because. Um, Velikovsky's theory was very threatening to the scientists of 1950. Uh, he was talking about um, religious events from the Bible 
that the scientists um, treat as if they were mythical or as if they were fairy tales. Velikovsky was trying to show that they were, that they were historical. Um, so from, from the standpoint of the dichotomy between religion and science, that was a little bit threatening. But more important than that, um, Velikovsky was claiming that his claim that a planet could, could be only a few thousand years old, not a billion years old, was a threat to the, um, the concept of uniformitarianism in, in the universe. This is a, a concept that is essential to Darwinism. Darwinism for evolution, the concept of evolution to be correct, it requires long, long periods of time where things work exactly the same as they always have. Hmm. Now, the, the, but it doesn't really directly um, threaten evolution in the in a biological sense. No, it doesn't. But but it it turns a number of important uh, astronomic theories on their head. I mean, the the uh, it would it created problems for theories of planet formation, for example. If the planets formed the way the astronomers say they formed, then Venus can't possibly be thousands of years old. Hmm. Okay. Right, so, so there are num, num, you know, there's, there's, there are turf issues and there are theory issues that made Velikovsky um, a threat. And then to make matters worse, Velikovsky was a person who had a reputation of his own, an, an international reputation. He had been involved in um, the founding of the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem alongside Einstein. And he had written an academic, edited an academic journal in Berlin alongside Einstein. And he was a colleague of Einstein's in at Princeton. And so Velikovsky had a reputation that that they couldn't just ignore. Right. And uh, the they they did try to uh, boycott his book to get it, the publisher to get rid of it, didn't they? Yeah, there was a, a very unusual situation that arose where the lead astronomer at Harvard University organized a boycott of the textbook division of Velikovsky's publisher as a way to arm twist them into not publishing the book. <laughs> and this is not the way that that academic scientists are supposed to behave. And did it work? Um, it did in a way. Um, here, uh, the publisher, the original publisher, Macmillan uh, and Company, had a runaway bestseller book, and they ended up transferring the rights to a company called Doubleday that had no textbook division as a way of, of defusing this boycott. Wow. Um did now I heard something about like the person who made that decision and ended up getting fired or something? Yes, the guy who initially signed Velikovsky got fired, and um, any astronomer with a reputation who tried to support Velikovsky um, had difficulties work wise. I think the guy who who ran the um, planetarium in Boston was fired because he dared to um, plan a show that supported Velikovsky's view of of events. Okay. And Velikovsky's view of event, can you give us an outline of what Velikovsky uh, suggested happened? Yes, and it's ba based primarily on ancient texts and ancient myths, which again is a problem for astronomers. Astronomers are not used to um, having that kind of evidence put forth to present an astronomic theory. But Velikovsky says that um, back sometime before 1500 B.C., some kind of an astronomic body slammed into Jupiter, and as a consequence of that, Venus was ejected from Jupiter. And that it was ejected as a comet that was so bright that the ancient cultures at first didn't even recognize Venus as being a planet. They, uh, they grouped it alongside the sun and the moon because it was so bright. You could see it move across the sky during the daytime. Wow. So Venus... Uh, which was in the pla same plane as the planet's orbits, um, moved through the solar system and created havoc, wreaked havoc on the planets, according to Velikovsky. It made a, a head-on impact with Mars, and um, th following that, both Venus and Mars made close contacts with the Earth that created a number of the situations that get described in biblical references, like the Ten Plagues of Egypt. Velikovsky blames the the titanic eruption of Thera, the volcano that ended the Minoan Empire and ended the Middle Kingdom in Egypt, he blames all that on the close approach of Venus to the Earth. Okay. Velikovsky also says that Mars made a close approach to Earth, responsible for extending the 360-day year that existed in ancient times, according to Velikovsky, 
and changed it into a 365 day year. And um, and I had honestly not read Velikovsky till fairly recently. And uh, there's a, a whole movement called the Electric Universe. Uh, Thunderbolts.org has a lot of it. And uh, they're very inspired. You know, they, they look to Velikovsky as their, their sort of the first guy who started this, in a sense. Yes. And when, you know, so finally, after reading some of their posts and finding it really interesting, I went back and read Worlds in Collision and was very impressed with it. And literally, as, as I finished it, I thought, huh, I wonder what modern science says about this. <laughs> and realize that's a daunting task to go through all that scientific effort to, to find out. But you did this. This is what your book is about, isn't it? Well, that's right, because I realized um, you know, I had, for a long time I had wanted to write about Velikovsky because it seemed to me that you know here we had been 50 and 60 years from the time Velikovsky wrote, and in that time there had been so much science. It seemed to me like there ought to be one fact you could point to that would be you know would turn the controversy that nobody could argue that would show that either Velikovsky had to be right or he had to be wrong, and that why hadn't anybody found that fact yet? And so I wanted to go through um, all of the recent good information we've been getting about Venus and Mars and Jupiter and comets and uh, other scientific bodies and try to sift through that and see if I could find that fact and and turn the controversy one way or the other. And in, in the end, which which side do you think comes out stronger? Well, in the end, I think the Velikovsky's comes out stronger. And the reason that I do is because... There are several different stages to Velikovsky's scenario, um, and at each one of these stages, um, if Velikovsky can be shown to be wrong about even one of his points, major pieces of his theory fall apart. At each stage, there's always a, a, a set of maybe a half a dozen facts like that, that if they went the wrong way, Velikovsky's got to be wrong. But time and time and time again, when you look at those facts, what you find out is there's an inconclusive answer. I compare it to um, to vetting a, a murder suspect. You know what the police do when they're trying to figure out who committed a crime. They will bring the suspect in, and they'll say, "They'll say, now where were you on the night of Saturday, the 27th, between the hours of eight and nine o'clock?" Now, if you can demonstrate that you weren't at the murder scene, then they let you go, and they don't have to worry about you. Well, so that's sort of what I was trying to do with this book of Velikovsky was at each of these scenarios say. Now, is, is there a fact anywhere that flatly says this has got to be false? And, and the, problem, the problem is that there isn't, and that in every case what you end up with is a half a dozen considerations that the scientists have to come up with an explanation to explain away, but that would all disappear if Velikovsky were right. Hmm. And to me, that's the hallmark of a theory that, that is right, not a hallmark of a theory that's wrong. Okay, and did you go into this with any expectations of him being right or wrong? No, I, I, I really um, was mostly concerned in trying to resolve it. And I, I couldn't understand why after 60 years it hadn't been resolved. Um, and I would have been happy if it had resolved either way. But to be able to say definitively, look, at here is the drop-dead reason why Velikovsky can't be right about this thing. But instead, what you find is that at 750 BC, when Velikovsky says Mars made its close approach to Earth, you have things, very odd things happening. For one thing, just after that, cultures all over the world who had a 365 day or 360 day year for thousands of years suddenly all changed to a 365 day year. Cultures that weren't in contact with each other. And, and that's really fascinating because that's not something that's just going to happen at random. How does uh, traditional science explain this? They don't. I mean, they say they, they look at the 360 day year as if it were a ceremonial year. So I went to my friend John Anthony West and I said, I know you're in contact with, with Egyptian scholars who know every last fact about the Egyptian calendars. Could you please ask them? to provide me with a one sentence explanation for why the Egyptians had to have a 365 day year in ancient times. Turns out they can't. Hmm. It turns out the actual evidence that their opinions based on is is contradictory. Really? That it can be looked at one of two different ways and if you look at it one way you conclude there was a 365 day year, you look at it the other way and you conclude it was 360. 
and that's the way all of this evidence falls. Two different ways to look at it might be right, might be wrong, but you have really odd things happening. Like, for instance, when they calculate um, eclipse dates that happened in the past, they, they have computer programs. It should be straight math because the planets should be moving like clockwork. And the the star, you know, the the sun and the moon and everything should be moving like clockwork. So they should be able to take a formula and calculate backwards and pinpoint the date and location of every eclipse that happened back in back into time. Turns out the calculation doesn't work across the 750 BC boundary. Huh. That they have reliable observers before 750 BC saying, oh, by the way, I saw an eclipse in such and such a city on such and such a date, and their, ca their computer program can't prove it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I ask, what could possibly cause that except a change in motion of something? And what would change the, the number of days of the year? What, what effect would, would create Well, that? there are a couple of things that could make that happen. It could happen if, if the distance of the Earth from the sun changed. If we got a little bit farther away from the sun, that could that could cause the year to be longer. It could happen if the speed at which we we move around the sun slowed down just a little bit. It could happen if um, the speed at which we rotate on our axis speeded up a little bit. Hmm. We'd end up with more days in a year. There are a number of different things that could legitimately cause it. Um, the most likely thing looks to me as if our distance from the the sun was increased a little bit. Really, and it, did that have any other effects that Velikovsky could pinpoint? Oh, there there are lots of very interesting things that happened. Okay, for instance, um, if you had a another astronomic body come that close to the Earth, you would expect a major period of eruptions of volcanoes. And sure enough, at the two intervals that Velikovsky says the close approaches were made suddenly you have this huge increase in the number of volcanoes that are erupting. You can see evidence of it in the Greenland. Uh, you can't see direct evidence of it in the ice um, cores that they make, but you can see indirect evidence because there are, are um, chemical values that change based on these eruptions. Hmm. Okay. And uh, okay. Go you got things like you've got a change at 750 BC in the absorption rate of of carbon by plants. So carbon dating doesn't work across the 750 boundary. Really? Huh. Yeah, something something really major happened. There was also a major fluctuation in the magnetic field at 750 BC that nobody can explain why it happened. Hmm. And you also have major changes in climate all over the world at 750 BC, so much so that you have Germanic tribes suddenly moving south all at the same time. And you have, you know, very odd things going on that imply that there was ma you have um, crops that were traditionally grown in China that could no longer be grown there. Oh, all right. Um, and there's also Venus itself, which has uh, a lot of telltales of being a comet, doesn't it? Yes, again, that until um, some of the recent probes, the Venus Express probe discovered a lot of things about Venus that weren't known before that make it look as if Velikovsky could be right. Um, for example, Velikovsky had said that, um, uh, some of this was known a while back, that he said, look, at if Venus is young, then it should still be very hot. And this was back in 1950 when science fiction writers were saying we ought to be able to colonize Venus. And, and the predictions were it was going to be a very cold place. Well, it was going to be a temperate place, yeah. is what they expected. But when we got there, we discovered the surface was hot enough to melt lead. And, and uh, if, if I remember right, the criticism was that he didn't specify a temperature, so he was wrong. Yeah, that's right. That's, in, in the end, they said, well, it's, it doesn't count as a prediction because he didn't specify what temperature they were going to find it at. But he's talking about a body that got ejected at, we're not sure what temperature from Jupiter, if he's right, that moved through all, all sorts of different uh, neighborhoods of the solar system at various temperatures that we don't know what they were, that would have had interactions with other planets that would have likely increased the temperatures in a way that we do, we don't understand, you can't quantify. And so, really, there's there's nothing more anybody could say about it except that we know that it should be hot. Hmm. And, but uh, you have other situations like uh, you've got, um, they've 
they've confirmed the existence of basalt on Venus, which is a rock that, it's a volcanic rock that forms shortly after an eruption, like within the, the first few thousand years. But they haven't confirmed the existence of granite, which takes millions of years. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and it also has a, a, its magnetic field kind of points towards us, doesn't it? It, it has a very weak magnetic field. Um, now, the magnetic field of the Earth is something that they feel had grew over time. As, as heavy metals sank to the core, the more heavy metals you have at the core, the more the magnetic field grows. Well, Venus, if it's a young planet, shouldn't have a strong magnetic field, and it doesn't. But what it does have is it has an ion tail that, that acts very much like a comet's tail. It, it points away from the sun. It gets stronger as Venus gets closer to the sun. And every time Venus makes its closest approach to the Earth, a couple of things happen. First of all, it always points its same face to the Earth, which is, uh, could be an indicator of a close approach between the two planets. It's called resonance. But this tail extends out into space at that point as far as the Earth, and it points directly at the Earth. Hmm. Okay. And now the, the Thunderbolts people also have, have gone a f good way toward proving that the, the destruction on Mars was caused by a, a another body coming in and exchanging literal, like, lightning bolts between planets. And uh, they go as far as to say the asteroid belt was once a part of Mars that was just literally thrown into space. And this seems like it would support the whole Venus idea colliding with Mars. Yes, I mean, and Caltech did a study that, uh, that showed that the damage they see on Mars could be the result of a single impact by a planet-sized body. And there, there are all of these different um, scientific studies that have been done. What I tr tried to do with my book is I tried to restrict myself to sources that had not been available to Belikovsky. Mm -hmm. Um and sources that had no no reason to um, either support or be against him. They, they didn't have an axe to grind with Velikovsky. And uh, so a lot of my sources were NASA websites and things like that. Uh, we've got um, astronomic records from ancient China that, that are synchronized with astronomic records from ancient Korea that on the same day are described by two different observers uh, in terms that normally are reserved for comets. Huh. And now we've got so, all sorts of different evidence like this that is very suggestive. Um, certainly, the, the least you can say about it is that it certainly allows for the possibility that Velikovsky could be right. Okay. Um, now you mentioned references, and I know uh, you've talked about how a lot of the stuff you cited in this book as for references online have disappeared. Yes, I had to put a disclaimer in the front of the book uh, because, um, okay, back in the day when everything was published on printed paper, if you were an author who published a study, the, the moment it got published, it was fair game for another author to read and quote and cite. Well, these NASA websites in particular... Uh, articles that go up on the NASA websites go through pass through a very very rigorous um, review process before they hit the website. So someone has done fact checking and someone has has cross checked to other people's theories, and it's a re all reasonable stuff when it hits the website. The problem is that when my editor went through my manuscript and and followed the links that I gave and went back to the websites that I was quoting, she discovered time and again that the passages that I quoted either had been changed or paragraphs removed or whole articles dropped not only from the NASA website but from half a dozen other websites that I knew they had been on originally. Huh. And so I had to put a disclaimer in the front of the book saying, look folks, this should have been fair game for me to quote. All The best I can do is say to you that I, I affirm that each of these quotes looks the way that it looked at the time that I um, quoted it. The ones that I could download and, and have copies on my computer of, I did. And the other ones, you know, I don't have control over what NASA t puts up or takes down from their website. But the best I can say is it, it was there once. It was fair game to quote when it was there. Right, right. Okay, I, we're almost out of time. I wanted to ask you a couple other quick things. First of all, a lot of people dismiss Velikovsky because of Carl Sagan. You, you want to talk for a, a quickly about that? Yes, again, Carl Sagan is the same person who who is... Um, uh, trundled out to uh, 
to put the kibosh on the Dogen information also. He was a popularizer of science that your average person would listen to. Um, Carl Sagan made uh, a number of comments about Velikovsky's, um, um, Velikovsky's work that um, have turned out to, to not, be, not be correct. Um, one thing he said was that he characterized the kind of event that would have to have happened at Jupiter to produce Venus. He said it would have had to have vaporized large portions of Jupiter um, and that those portions of Jupiter would remain intensely hot even today if Velikovsky were right. Well, as it turns out, there is a Chinese study that was done recently to try to explain why the core of Jupiter is half the size that it should be and twice as hot as it should be. Hmm. And the computer study concludes that a body slammed into Jupiter at some point and vaporized the core. <laughs> so in a lot of cases, Carl Sagan's, the complaint that Carl Sagan makes against Velikovsky ends up turning into um, the evidence that supports him. Okay, and didn't they have some kind of uh, a meeting or something that, that was supposed to have officially dismissed Velikovsky's theory? Yes, the uh, AAAS uh, held a symposium in, in San Francisco in 1979, no, 1973 or four, that was um, touted as a referendum on Velikovsky's theory. And they, they promised Velikovsky that he would time to have time to answer all of his critics. But the way they ended up setting up the conference, they had half a dozen people speak against Velikovsky and then gave Velikovsky equal time with one, you know, every speaker had the same amount of time. So there really was six, six times as much time devoted against Velikovsky as for him. Hmm. And most people um, uh, in the public came away feeling that Velikovsky's theory had been refuted by that 1974 symposium. But the truth of the matter is that all, all it really did was put the scientists in a position to sweep the whole issue under the rug and not have to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I, I think the only thing with the book I had a problem with was his theory of the whole manna from heaven issue coming from Venus's tail. Yes, and one of the things that I, one of the approaches I took with the book was to say that a lot of the chemistry that Velikovsky includes in his uh, Worlds in Collision book, there's not enough evidence to evaluate it. Yeah. In other words, it, it's a very generalized statement of here's the chemical, re the general chemical reaction that, that probably happened, not knowing what the composition of Jupiter uh, was or what Venus might have been at the time any of these events happened. And so I took the approach that I wasn't going to try to evaluate that. I'm not trying to prove or disprove Velikovsky's chemistry. Um, let's look at the things that, that we can quantify a little bit and see how they stack up and leave the chemistry to speculation. Okay. Um, the Dogon actually had a list of like planetary bodies and stuff like that. Did they say anything in particular about Venus that's relevant? No, the Dogon don't have any information about Venus that, that is uh, pertinent to what Velikovsky has to say. Um, other ancient cultures do talk about Venus before 1500 BC, but the references they give and the drawings they make and the icons they use to represent Venus all have comet symbolism. Huh. And so, uh, and then the, uh, the deities that are associated with Venus with this comet symbolism eventually turn into deities that are associated with the planet Venus. But there's nothing definitive to say that Venus was a planet when it was first um, documented by these cultures. And when, when supposedly would this have happened? Like when, when did Sang slam into Jupiter? Does he give an exact date? No, he doesn't give an exact date. Um, we know that the approach that Venus was supposed to have made to the Earth happened around the time of the eruption of Thera, which is about 1500 BC. What we don't know is for how many thousands of years Venus might have roamed as a comet prior to that. I see. Okay. All right. Um, do you think if science actually worked the way it should, that Velikovsky would be uh, held in high regard today? It's very hard to say, uh, because it's not just the scientific world that works this way. Anytime there's an entrenched theory that a lot of effort has gone into, there's going to be major effort to try to, to not undermine that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's hard to say that whether science could have an open enough mind to be able to embrace somebody like Velikovsky 
it is true these days. The t- statistic I've heard is that most of the the game changing discoveries that are being made in science these days are being made by people who are outside the field, and that um, I think has Belikovsky had a major influence on that being true. Hmm. All right. Um, and there's a rumor too that Einstein died with worlds in collision open on his desk, isn't there? Yeah, and I I haven't been able to verify whether that's actually true or not. It's reasonable because they were friends and close friends. And just before Einstein died, there was a discovery made that supported Velikovsky that Einstein wanted to evaluate. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense to me that he probably would have, had, even if it wasn't there the night he died, he certainly had been looking into it. All right. Well, we're pretty much out of time. Let's uh, one more time. People can get your books, obviously, in all the normal places, but also from innertraditions.com. That's right. And your new book will probably be out, you have an estimate? I, I would guess it'll be a year or a little less. Okay, all right. And when did the Velikovsky book come out? The Velikovsky book um, has been out since October of last year. Okay, that's the Velikovsky Heresies. And right. uh, you have an unofficial website at LairdScranton.com. That's right. Okay. Well, I thank you so much for uh, calling in. And, well, thank uh, you, and uh, I'll... Uh, be sure to be in contact with you when the new book comes out. Yes, I'm, I'm very curious to see what you've come up with. The, uh, your work is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Last Exit for the Lost is up next to taking you out with some Psyche Corporation. Come in. Do you need me? Do you understand the numbers pouring over your connection? To perfection. Singing, soaking into our transmission. 1597 and counting and counting Can you hear-